If you try me, be warned, this is no game. If given the chance, I'll drive you insane. I'll ravish your body, I'll control your mind. I'll own you completely, your soul will be mine. The nightmares I'll give you while lying in bed, the voices you'll hear from inside your head, the sweats, the shakes, the visions you'll see, I want you to know, these are all gifts from me. But then it's too late and you'll know in your heart that you're mine and we shall not part. You'll regret that you tried me, they always do, but you came to me, not I to you. You knew this would happen, many times you were told, but you challenged my power and chose to be bold. You could have said no and just walked away. If you could live that day over, now, what would you say? I'll be your master, you'll be my slave. I'll even go with you when you go to your grave. Now that you've met me, what will you do? Will you try me or not? It's all up to you. I can bring you more misery than words can tell. Come, take my hand. Let me lead you to hell. According to the official Scottish Government figures, drug and alcohol misuse costs the public purse £7.1 billion every year. Professor Neil McKegney, one of the UK's most respected academics in the study of drug misuse, describes Scotland as the country that in the mid-1960s barely had a drug problem worthy of the name now has a drugs problem greater than almost anywhere in Europe. Scotland also has one of the highest drug-related death rates anywhere in Europe. At a more local level, figures published jointly by the Scottish Government's Information Services Division and NHS National Services Scotland show the area of the country with the highest prevalence of drug use is here in Inverclyde, centred around the former shipbuilding and industrial towns of Greenock and Port Glasgow. The Joint Government NHS document reveals that an astonishing 3.2% of the entire population of Inverclyde is identified as problem drug users. Pejorative terms for people addicted to drugs or alcohol are still commonly used. Who looked at the man sitting on the bench over there and thought, he's just a junkie or a jakey or an alkie? Why does society largely still look down on people with addictions? Addiction is an illness just as heart disease and cancer are illnesses. So why does society generally look less sympathetically on addiction sufferers compared to cancer sufferers? The obvious and immediate response to that question is, well, no one chooses to have cancer, but actually no one chooses to become addicted to drugs or alcohol. You could be an addict, I could be an addict. An addict could be our brother, our sister, our mother, our father, our son, our daughter, or a friend. You know, addiction doesn't discriminate, you know, rich, poor, black, white, uh, gay, straight. There are no, um, you know, it holds no boundaries around who becomes addicted. It can happen to anyone. It's an equal opportunities condition. An addict for me is um, somebody who needs to escape, um, to escape reality around them. I was always seeking uh, solutions out, outside myself to make me feel whole uh, and complete. I'd help my family to get drugs, yeah, the most important people in my life who I didn't really care about. When drugs were more important to me than, uh, than my family. When we look at addiction, it's very easy to be pessimistic. Look at the financial cost mentioned earlier. Look at the human cost of destroyed lives and people dying far too young. Look at the cost to society. But there is a positive side to the story of addiction. The positive is the story of recovery. Even here in Inverclyde, the area of Scotland with the highest prevalence of drug use, people and organisations work tirelessly with addicts to address their problems and turn around their lives. From its office in Greenock's Jamaica Street, Moving On provides a confidential service tailored to individuals' needs and seeks to reduce the personal, family, and social harm caused by drug misuse in Inverclyde. Well, what we would hope to do in treatment is to help people to, to regain some stability in their life, to be able to function well, to be able to cope with life's difficulties and have better relationships, just to have a general improvement in their health and well-being. And that's up to the individual to tell us when they feel they've achieved that goal. 
So we don't set goals, we work with our service users in a collaborative way to help identify goals and areas for change and then we help facilitate that change along with key partners um, to work on what's called recovery orientated systems of care. Jericho House in Greenox Bank Street is a 16-bed male-only residential unit offering rehabilitation services to people with addictions to drugs. A similar unit for women has recently opened in the town's Shanklin Road. Although ultimately run by the Jericho community of the Monastery of Jesus, the facility does not require a religious commitment from those seeking help. A prerequisite of the programme is, however, a commitment to total abstinence from drugs and alcohol. Stephen Ferguson is in recovery. He's been resident in Jericho House for over a year, fighting his addiction by following the facility's 12-step recovery programme. So I, I believe that I, 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 I used own, own feelings. I used to escape uh, my reality. And I've done a lot of other things to escape reality as well. You know, where I self-harmed and, and stuff like that uh, because I couldn't cope. And, attempted suicide, stuff like that, you know, my, 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 I couldn't really cope with my life, my life was horrible, I was in a really dark place, man, before I came here. If I be honest, uh, when I came here, I didn't really know, I didn't really know, no, I knew I needed help, uh, I wanted to stop using drugs, I, I wasn't in the frame of mind where I was going to stop using drugs forever, uh, that, that wasn't my, my plan, but now, through looking at stuff, looking at kind of the, the problems I caused man, in, in my life, eh, to family and to myself and stuff like that, now, I, I was really suicidal eh, for the last wee period of my using and, and, I, and I, I just wanted to die, you know, and it was like, no, I've got me a positive outlook on life, you know, I, I came here hating myself, eh, I like myself now through the help of the staff in here. Eh, I get to a stage where I actually like myself and and I don't want to die anymore. No. Fit Janchak has also been resident in Jericho House for over a year. He understands but rejects the often heard view that addiction is self-inflicted and so scarce public resources should not be spent on providing help for addicts. Before I was probably, probably be on the same place, I would say uh, those, those people don't deserve help because it was their own choice to use the drugs and uh, do all those bad things, crime. Because you would say it's a kind of common sense, don't steal, don't take drugs, don't harm people and don't do those things. But now I know I couldn't help myself. I, I didn't choose to take drugs and do all that stuff. But I don't want to use the old words, but I was powerless over an addiction. I, was, I couldn't help myself, I had to. I, I, so it's a, it's a disease, you know, most people wouldn't believe it, I wouldn't believe it before. I would say that people just using it as an excuse, but it's no excuse. You know, it's uh, People need that help, to be honest. I needed the help. Without Jericho and people who helped me on my journey, I wouldn't know what I suffer from. And I, I, I wouldn't help myself, I would probably end up in a jail or dead. Jamie Conway was addicted to heroin. He almost died. Now though, Jamie runs at Inverclyde Recovery Cafe, a social hub providing a safe and friendly place where people in recovery can meet to support each other and share experiences. Recovery for me involves everything. Um, I came into recovery and I was told to be saying that there's only one thing you have to change and that's everything. Um, but it's about changing one thing at a time. Um, and it starts off with, for me it started off from putting down drugs, not using drugs. Um, and then just growing from that. Um, back what I was saying last time is about getting a, a little understanding of, of what was going on for us. What, maybe why I, I used drugs every day because I didn't know. Um, I remember parents and stuff asking me and, and the only time I was able to give them an honest answer was when I told them, I don't know. Um, I could come up with hundreds of excuses, or oh, it's just to relax, I'm, I get dead nervous, I get dead anxious, and, and, and I need to use this or that. It was all lies. Um, it, was just, it, was, it was just that escape, you know, and um, when I said I didn't know, that was, that was my honest answer, no. Um, 
Recovery involves being a human being, um, a human being with, with thoughts and feelings and, and emotions and um, all the stuff that, that I was masking for a lot, a lot of years. Um, allowing myself to be that person and to become to become a member of society today, you know what I mean? Where I'm working, where I'm paying taxes, I'm paying for my house, I'm paying for my car, I'm, I'm doing all these things, you know what I mean? Um, I didn't believe normality was an option for me for a lot of years and now it's just about being normal, or as normal as possible, whatever normal is. In recent years, government and academic reports have highlighted strong links between poverty, deprivation, widening inequalities and problem drug use. In Inverclyde, consistently amongst the areas of Scotland with the highest levels of unemployment, every fourth child is living in poverty. Without hope and opportunity, there is a marked increase in the likelihood young people in deprived areas may drift towards misuse of drugs and alcohol. Um, unfortunately, if you're poor and you live in a deprived community, you're going to be more susceptible. Um, so there is a, 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 a difference between you know, someone who is, you know, ha has many uh, opportunities, has, many, has social capital to those who haven't. You know, you'll see much higher rates of addiction in, in poorer communities. Um, but that's not to say that you won't find it elsewhere as well. Addiction is an illness, not a crime. Yet we continue to stigmatise and we continue to jail people who are actually ill. You know, our prisons are full of people who are addicted. You know, over Court and Vale done some research quite a while ago now, maybe a seven or eight years ago, and they say 99% of the girls in Court and Vale are addicts. Hello. You know, we are jailing people who are ill. If you think that this is a choice, you know, all you have to do is go and look at those girls. Go and look at the guys and girls who are standing at the chemists. Go and look at the guys and girls who are hanging about the pubs. The, you know, it's very obvious to my eyes that these people are unwell. <laughs> very obvious, you know, so um, the fact that we jail and we criminalise um, people who are sick or who are suffering um, I think history will judge us as a society very, very harshly for how we, we currently treat people uh, with addiction problems. And I see it very similar to, you know, in the old asylums, we look back and aghast at how we treated people with, men with mental illness, even up to 50, 60 years ago. And I, I'm absolutely certain um, our children's children will look back at how we dealt with addiction as well and be horrified. After food and oil, the third most valuable industry in the world is illegal drugs, with an estimated yearly value of £294 billion, all of which is controlled by criminals. Without any form of legal oversight or regulation, drugs like heroin and cocaine are being cut with rat poison, kitchen scouring powder, even brick dust, in order that dealers can maximise profits. The first use of the phrase, the war on drugs, was by former American President Richard Nixon in 1971. 45 years later, we're still not winning that war, which suggests a different, more radical approach is overdue. In December 2015, Kenny McCaskill, a member of the Scottish Parliament, publicly voiced the opinion that he believes we should be looking to decriminalise drugs. What was so significant about Mr McCaskill's comments was that between 2007 and 2014, he was the Cabinet Secretary for Justice in the Scottish Government. He is the most senior politician in the UK to advocate decriminalisation. In an exclusive interview for this programme, Kenny McCaskill explained his position. The reason I spoke out is I think you need people to put their head above the parapet to be prepared to say and who can do so with some authority. As a former Justice Secretary, did I think this before I stood down? Yes. Why did I not speak out? Because I'm a member of the Cabinet and it would be inappropriate. But now I've got time and space, I can say what I think many others in government, in the police, in the judiciary, in the prison service, never mind in the health service, say the current system is making things worse, not better. There has to be a better way, and we've got to start that debate. 
you say that there's consensus across the, the range of, of the, the, the sort of sectors that you mentioned there, and I think that's absolutely right. Um, but so how, how do you deal or how do you respond to people like Graham Pearson, who's the, the justice spokesperson for the Labour Party? When he, he went as far as saying that what you were suggesting was potentially dangerous, how, how do you respond to that? Well, I think I just regret that. I, I, I know, Graham. I think at the end of the day, uh, there's a fear of uh, being savaged by the media. And that's why no current governmental incumbent, uh, I, have the, I have the freedom because not only am I out of government, I'm stepping out from politics and I can say what I feel. But there is, frankly, just a conspiracy of silence. Everybody knows if they were drilled down, is it working? Other than a few zealots would say, of course it's not. Is there a better way? Probably yes, but nobody wishes to do so. Some will say it's about timing. Others just put it in the too difficult to do box. But there are winds of change happening in the world. They've happened in Portugal, they've happened in the Netherlands, they're happening in the United States. Those winds will blow into Scotland in a matter of time. Is that going to be months? No, it's going to be years, but I believe it will change because it has to change because the enforcement policy is bringing down states, not just communities, in terms of narco states, not just communities run by drug gangs. It's damaging our communities in terms of deaths, in terms of ill health, and it simply isn't working. I always remember a very senior business figure I knew saying, if you looked at it from a business point of view and consultancy, you would say, is it working? Is it economic? Is there a better way? And the answer from a consultant, whether a big accountancy firm or others, would be, this ain't working. So sadly, we have a problem at the present moment, sometimes for narrow political vested interests, other times just for fear. People who I think really know what the situation is just don't want to speak out. I was Justice Secretary for over seven and a half years. I can safely say that the overwhelming majority of the people I interacted with all think there has to be a better way and the current system isn't working. Part of the argument, I think, for decriminalisation is that um, drugs could be regulated, that, that people would know exactly what they're taking. Um, and you can see how that would work with the likes of heroin mm -hmm. and that kind of, of drug. Would it work with the, sort of the newer so-called legal highs of psychoactive drugs? Would decriminalisation allow the authorities to, to regulate what's going into these pills that young people are taking? No, but then at the end of the day, there's nothing that really the state can do in some situations if people choose to do actions that are damaging to their health. If people drink alcoholic drinks that are fundamentally damaging despite the fact that it's a lawful product and it's regulated and licensed because whether it's cheap, whether it's the stimulation they want, people will take hooch, moonshine, stuff off the back of a lorry. And to some extent, it will always be the same with drugs. People will always choose to do something. You can advise against it, you can warn against it, and I think it would always be the case that in decriminalisation, some things might be viewed as too unacceptable. What you're doing here is trying to minimise risk mitigate harm. It's all about what is the least worst option. So it would be for a commission to discover, but it'd be to discuss and confirm the details, but it'd be perfectly possible to decriminalise possession at certain amounts, to li <laughs> license some drugs, and then to deal more stringently and more you know, effectively uh, against others. That is all perfectly possible. We see an amalgam of that happening, as I say, whether it's Portugal or the, uh, uh, or the United States. So I think that's where the debate has to go. How do we do something to roll back the, the increase in, in the criminality and the levels of violence, take out some of the money that's undermining economies of governments, not just individuals, and communities and improve the lives of others. Will people still do something that if you take this, you can get high, but you can also go to an early grave? Some people sadly will choose, still choose to do that. So we can't stop every catastrophe, but we can make it overall better. Classic utilitarianism. How do we get the maximum good for the most people? This is a sort of overarching question. In terms of addiction, and recovery. Is there a role for the criminal justice system? And if so, what is it? Well, I think there always has to be because there are criminal gangs and cartels. I mean, I actually come at this probably more from a law enforcement criminal justice perspective than do from health. I think health is already aware that they have to work it. But I mean, the reason I have spoken out is, 
You know, when I first came in at Justice Secretary, most warrants that would come to me for covert surveillance and interception, say mobile phones, would be about drugs. Now it's drugs and a firearm. When I first became Justice Secretary, the, you would hear about people being stabbed in the buttocks. That was because it was thought it was a safe place to stay, even though it wasn't, and it was the payment of a drug debt. Now it's the production of a firearm. The levels of violence that we see in London and Liverpool, they will come north. I've already seen, you know, and been privy to papers that frighten me in terms of, you know, what is available because there's so much money available. And actually, you only have to look at countries like Mexico. They put in the police, they get corrupted. So they put in the federal police and they get corrupted. Now they put in the army. We have countries, not simply in Central America, there are countries in West Africa that are narco states. If the people in this country wonder where terrorists get their money to carry out terrorist activity, the jihadist gangs, they tax drugs coming into Western Europe. It comes from West Africa through North Africa and into Europe. And Al-Qaeda in North Africa impose a tax upon the drugs that come in. You know, at the end of the day, if we want to tackle drug gangs, then we have to be able to deal so effectively. So you have to be able to put some issues to the side and not part that. You have to be able to know who you're dealing with. So as I say, this would allow law enforcement not to deal with street dealers, street addicts, but to concentrate on those who are making maximum money out of the most harm. The one downside is, and this has always concerned me about liberalisation and legalisation of some aspects, at the end of the day, some people are going to commercialise what I think is wrong. The people in America who make money out of the legalisation of cannabis are the tobacco companies. They're geared up, ready to roll. The tobacco companies want it, the alcohol companies oppose it. <laughs> I don't like the tobacco companies in terms of their actions, but at the end of the day, it's probably better that they do it so you know what the product is, you take it away from the drug gangs and the cartels and the AQ in North Africa, and then you can say to people, you can have that, but you're not getting this. Any initiative to tackle drug addiction and help recovery is going to struggle when you consider that um, the core problem is linked clearly, the evidence is there to link it clearly to social deprivation, to unemployment, to poverty. Um, places like Inverclyde ha have the highest unemployment, highest levels of poverty and the highest level of drug abuse in Scotland. So uh, are we facing a situation where any initiative is, is going to fail and let, until we tackle the core problems of, of social deprivation? I think you make a fair point. I think, you know, there are people who take drugs for hedonistic and lifestyle reasons. I was always amazed that the drug problem in Shetland tends not to come from poverty, but from people who basically do it because, well, I go out in the North Sea and I could not come back because a hundred foot wave. And actually, you know, I can see where they're coming from, not that I support it or I would recommend it, but, you know, the tragedy was that the Shetland's drug problem wasn't from people in peripheral housing estates, but the point you make about Inverclyde, Edinburgh, whatever else, yes, it's people without hope, aspiration, self-esteem. But it's not either or, it's both. I think we do have to try and tackle the underlying reasons that people, you know, take to drugs because they don't believe that life is any that they have any value or that life has any hope uh, and therefore it is an escape. Uh, so I think we have to differentiate between hedonism, you know, the, the, the yuppies snorting cocaine or whatever, I don't have any time for that. Equally, if they want to do it, you can warn against it, but th there's a limit to what you can do. Those, as I say, uh, you know, with the real social and economic problems, equally what we've got to do is locking them up on a regular basis making them turn to crime, that's not solving it. What we've got to do is uh, treat it as a health problem. That's why I look to Portugal, where has crime gone down? Yes. Has it gone away? No. Has drug consumption gone down? Yes. Has it ceased? No. They have minimised and mitigated harm. Some of these things are other solutions, social, economic, health, education, but it doesn't undermine the argument that we should change policy in drugs. In the making of this programme, we've, we've spoken to a lot of people who are involved in the front line, as it were, uh, in terms of addiction and recovery. People who work for charities, people who work for organisations, statutory organisations, and people who have been addicted and are now in recovery. Uh, in general, they all say that um, the Scottish Government's road to recovery is, is a step in the right direction, but it's not enough. Um, one of the criticisms we've heard quite often is that Politicians don't listen. Politicians aren't listening 
to the people who are you know, affected, whether they're addicts or whether they're working with addicts. Do you think that's a fair comment that, that politicians in general are not listening? I think you make a fair point there. I think, you know, Fergus Ewing did a remarkable job with the road to recovery. It is the best that there can be, but within narrow parameters. And that's why if we actually want to make progress, we've got to, we've got to get off the page that we're currently working on. And we've got to have a blank sheet of paper other than saying it can't be the same and it can't be just enforcement. That's not going to work. So I think politicians, do they know it's not working? Yes, it's simply been mitigation and management of the media. Equally, I have to say, I think that the uh, media would not necessarily be as hostile, and we've seen that with some press here. Never mind, I think laws actually have to be supportive by the people. You know, the big change in Scotland over recent years has been drink driving. There was a time when I was considerably younger, if you got caught drink driving, it was bad luck me. Now it's a total anathema, entirely unacceptable, despite making the laws tighter and arguments for tighter still. We're in a situation where People are taking drugs, some legal, some non-psychoactive substances and of late eyes. They're not necessarily all in housing estates, deprived areas. They're middle class aid, middle class kids. They're middle aged people. <laughs> there's doctors, there's lawyers, there's probably judges, police people are all taking some form of recreational drugs. And I don't necessarily support that and would argue that, I, that they shouldn't. Equally, you know, I don't think we can criminalise that, we are damaging. Uh, so when you get to about 40% of people think the law is bonkers, the law, frankly, is undermined. And that's why we need to start again, decide what we're going to be, you know, what we need to do, does anything need to be legalised, what can be decriminalised, what then needs to be, you know, dealt with specifically. So that would then allow, as I say, health to do their job, police to do their job and the prisons to be full of those who need to be there, who have maximised harm, made money out of people's misery, not those who have, frankly, shared in the misery. You, you mentioned Portugal already um, and the, the, the quite clear, again, evidence that shows since they decriminalised drug possession, drug use has gone down, uh, the rates of HIV have gone down through needles not being shared and so on. And there's also states in America where, where they, they can show similar things. So the evidence is there to support decriminalisation. So when you spoke out and, and supported it, um, were you disappointed that the Scottish government immediately said, we have no plans to go down that road? In some ways, but you know, I think that's to be expected. I think these things are slow burn. You know, I think what you have to do is you have to have somebody put the head above the parapet. It was done before down in England with Professor Nutt, who was treated appallingly. I think it's not a criticism of him because I think he's a remarkably talented enable and was a brave man, but it probably needed somebody from a different walk of life. You know, so these things will come back because I won't be the last, I'm not the first uh, to say it, it will come. I think it will be driven from abroad. There's always been the fear amongst politicians that you'll be monstered by the press because I could write the headlines if Scotland was to go in that direction. It'd be the same headlines that Portugal got every junkie in the Iberian Peninsula or mainland Europe is going to head for the Algarve. That was what was said. Everybody will go there because there's just drugs. They'll be lying on the beach in Albufeira shooting up. It hasn't happened. People don't leave their homes. They don't leave American states and go to Canada because there's a different drug policy. They stay in their home and they get treatment and address it there. So in some ways, I can only say what I can. There's an opportunity now for the SNP. There's an election coming which puts people on their guard. But at some stage, are we just going to roll out the road to recovery for another five years? Are we going to allow people to suffer harm? Are we going to see a new generation coming through who aren't taking heroin and cocaine? They're taking legal drugs. And if we can't deal with illegal drugs, how the hell are we going to deal with legal drugs? Faces and Voices of Recovery is a charity that challenges many of the issues associated with recovery from addiction, such as stigma, discrimination, barriers to accessing services, and lack of social justice. Anne-Marie Ward, herself a recovering addict, is the charity's chief executive. You know, addiction is probably the biggest um, killer um, in the Western world. And somehow we are in collective denial about that. You know, it's like, so well, let's, let's just point the finger and blame people for being moral degenerates. You know, let's not look at why our young people are, are you know, desperate to get out their heads on any sort of high um, 
Let, let's not bother looking at that. Why are our ordinary working class, middle class people um, drinking two, three bottles of wine per night? Uh, you know. So yeah, I'd like I'd I'd like us to be talking more about why um, we why it's so intolerable that we need to escape. What is so intolerable about you know us needing to escape all the time? And, um, and those levels of escape, you know, just because you use one substance or one behaviour, what, what is it about that that's socially acceptable or unacceptable? So if you're using Chablis or Chianti every evening and I'm using heroin, what is the difference, you know? As a society, it's a fix. And whatever we, or whatever reason we're using it, you know, whether it be a substance or a behaviour, what is it that's so intolerable that we are in a constant state of fixing? Um, so, yeah, I'd like to just hear us talk more. <laughs>